Hi, Fox. Thanks for attending this session. And uh, how are you? Uh, my name is Hui Zhao Zhao, and uh, today I feel deeply honored to be here to share our learnings and the journeys regarding how to run Spark on Kubernetes. And uh, let me introduce myself firstly. And, uh, and uh, I have been working, I, I from Apple AIML uh, department, I have been working on design, develop, and manage large-scale Spark uh, cluster and Spark uh, workloads on uh, Kubernetes around the four years now. And uh, throughout um, our journey, most recently, we have encountered some new and uh, very crucial new requests from our internal end users which is inspiring us try to exploring a new way to allow users to run their Spark workload on Kubernetes, which is running Apache standalone cluster on top of Kubernetes. And uh, over the next uh, 30 minutes, I try to have a deep dive to this topic. So I try to <coughs> firstly introduce what's our existing, you know, platform on our uh, how to run Spark workload on Kubernetes. And then why we need, uh, what kind of challenges we are facing right now, and why we introduce this new way. And then I try to give you uh, some high level design principles we try to achieve and the detailed implementation for that. And the uh, last thing is like, uh, what's our ongoing work going to, to do? Uh, as you know, Apache Spark is an open source software engineer, a so software, and which is kind of a distributed computation engine. Just in a few of lines of code, in either you know Python, Scala, or even Circle, data scientists and engineer can easily define a Spark application to process a huge amount of data, and the Spark will take care of parallelizing the work with the help of a cluster of machines. However, um, Spark itself cannot uh, manage this kind of machines uh, directly. Usually, it will rely on some third-party class managers to help it. Uh, there are some popular you know, class managers like uh, Hadoop Young, Apache Mosos, or uh, Kubernetes, as, of course. So around several years ago, we have been exploring how to run in Spark on Kubernetes. And uh, um, we, uh, through this kind of journey, we find that there is quite a lot of kind of advantages if we can take this design. First of all, uh, the full containerization, this kind of capability, makes the Spark application uh, is very agile and portable. Our data scientists and uh, engineers can easily install whatever packages to the container images and run it everywhere. And uh, this is really helpful and speed up our developers' you know, development velocity and iterations. Um, secondly, and uh, by running Spark workload on cloud, with the help of Kubernetes, we can easily apply the auto-scaling features to uh, Spark applications, so we can automatically adjust the scale in or scale out the machines to adjust the different size of Spark workload. This helps us to save a lot of cost to our internal users as well. And uh, thirdly, and uh, you know, we always try to take in security and privacy as the first uh, citizens to our platform. This is really important, especially we, when we try to, you know, build a multi-tenant platform for our users. <laughs> With the help of Kubernetes, such as, you know, uh, service accounts and cluster roles, uh, such as uh, this kind of, you know, security control services provided by Kubernetes itself, we can very easily to apply authentication tokens or authorization policies to every Spark port and or even every data access operations inside the Spark workload. 
here is our existing uh, architecture, how to run in Spark workloads on top of Kubernetes. From this picture, you can see we build a unified batch processing gateway. And we leverage this gateway, firstly, to manage several, several configurable uh, numbers of Spark Kubernetes cluster. And once this gateway gets the request from whatever API call, command line, Airflow operator, or Jupyter notebook, it will translate this kind of request to a CRD object. So here, what is a CRD object? And uh, you can see on each Spark Kubernetes clusters, we install several Spark Kubernetes operator. And uh, the CRD object are going to be routed to the corresponding Spark EKS cluster, and the operator will process this kind of CRD instance. And uh, basically, the operator is going to try to translate all the fields defined in the CRD object to a parameter required by the Spark submit, if you're familiar like uh, you know, Spark. And it provides a Spark submit, and uh, also it already you know, supports Kubernetes as a cluster manager as default, so that Spark submit script can directly talk to Kubernetes endpoints. And uh, by leveraging this shell script, Spark operator can help you to spawn a bunch of pods, which is including one Spark driver pod and several numbers of Spark executor pod. And uh, at the bottom, you can see we leverage Unicore to apply the resources quota per each tenant. And of course, we also leverage autoscaler, cluster autoscaler, and or carpenter to automatically adjust the machine or trigger the new machine to create it to support the new port. <clears throat> and you may have a lot of kind of, you know, um, uh, questions regarding this kind of architecture, but uh, let's have a deep dive later if we have time at the end. We have been leveraging this um, cluster to support large-scale production workloads on our, uh, on our internal uh, platform for several years. And we made a lot of uh, internal customizations and refactors to this open source software, which is Spark Kubernetes operator. However, we are still facing some new challenges. And uh, here is a brief summary. <clears throat> First of all, we do have a lot of very short processing Spark applications. And uh, this is, we got, uh, we got a lot of requests from our end users and they, we, they try to require their small applications to be finished in only around three to four minutes. And also, the interval of each Spark application, they need to be less than 30 seconds. You can imagine all of this kind of Spark application task is scheduled by Airflow or other, you know, orchestrators. And uh, you also can imagine any kind of job schedule de delay or kind of pod allocation delay will lead into the failures to a Spark application or even the whole um, Airflow DAX. And uh, from the previous uh, architecture, you may also notice we also provide uh, interactive uh, analytics capabilities to our users. So what does that mean? That means if a user wants to have a query session, query session via the Jupyter Notebook, it will also need our backend to spawn a bunch of pods. So that means uh, if we can reduce the startup time of the pod creation as well, help, very helpful to enhance our user experience. <coughs> Thirdly, Gen AI, of course, is a very hot topic right now. And uh, on our platform, we also try to provide both data parallelism and model parallelism to our platform. 
So that's why we try to explore how to run a long-running Ray cluster on top of Spark. However, the existing architecture cannot uh, satisfy this need. Uh, that's why we conduct a lot of you know, research and uh, try to find uh, some way to reduce the start, up, the start up time of each Spark application and also try to find a new way to run in this kind of a machine learning framework. <coughs> to find the, firstly, let's try to find the root cause why the, spot, uh, the Spark application start up, uh, start up time taking so much time. Firstly, let's uh, check what happened when CRD uh, wrote it to the Spark operator and how Spark, Spark operator does. And uh, from this workflow of uh, Kubernetes operator, we can see once the controller received the Spark application CRDs, and it will firstly translate to a shell script, and then using the submission runner to submit, to execute this shell script and allow it to talk to API server directly. And then the driver pod going to be created. And then the Spark driver pods will directly talk to the API server to spawn the bunch of executor pods. Um, we can see there, there are going to be a long negotiation process, especially when for example, there is one Spark application that requires thousands of executor pods and uh, our bottom components like Unico or Autoscaler need to find the machines or create new machines to allocate this kind of you know, bunch of executor pods. However, the Spark operator right now, its involvement already exists. Of course, it will provide some pod monitoring and web validations, and also it will try to help you to create the Spark UI service, U, uh, uh, Spark UI service and ingress rules. But it is a long negotiation process. Another thing I want to point out here is that once the Spark application workload is completed, and the Spark operator will terminate the driver pod and all the corresponding executor pod. This is actually is a totally unnecessary uh, repeated uh, you know, port creation, creation and deletion, especially when we try to you know, run in a production grade workload. Because typically, this kind of workload, there is no frequent uh, you know, Docker image change or configuration change. This is totally a waste. <coughs> On the other hand, we try to exploring what the Spark uh, what the Spark capabilities already provide. It provides a standalone mode um, to all users to you know um, create a tiny cluster on your local machine to a te test or experimental purpose. Its basic idea is uh, is try to run a shell script to start some you know JVM process. Among of this JVM, I mean Java process, there is one master process and several worker process. And uh, we can take this master as a simulated cluster manager, and it provides some restful API to all users to able to repeated Spark, uh, submit the Spark application to these tiny clusters. And also, this master provides a default faithful scheduler to allocate the different uh, you know, Spark applications uh, and, to, you know, and uh, also monitoring the workers' uh, usage metrics <laughs> and uh, monitor the health of this simulated uh, cluster. So, as an infra engineer, we try we have a global picture um, compared to our you know end users because we have both kind of um, infra. Uh, we have kind of global pictures to the infra and also both to the Spark app uh, core, uh, core code base. So, what we're trying to do here is we try to continuous 
leverage Spark's ectopis to help us uh, manage the, you know, handling like uh, virtual machine provisioning, auto scaling, and this kind of security control. And, but on the other hand, we try to leverage Spark's inherent uh, class manager's functionality to maintain a master and worker for us. That being said, if we can find a way to keep the master and the worker running on top of a pod, so we can uh, have a better situation here. Our justification is here. If we can keep a master and a worker running on top of a Kubernetes, there are going to be no machine, I mean virtual machine, startup delay. There are going to be no container image pooling delay. No Kubernetes API and the Unicor interactively with the you know, cloud private provider delay to allocate the pod. <coughs> From the user side, here is another difference, like uh, um, especially compared to the previous architecture. Right now, we only need to expose the master's endpoint. Instead, we totally hide the Kubernetes endpoint, endpoint for users. <laughs> And also, it totally, you know, simplifies, uh, you know, management uh, as uh, infra engineers. <laughs> and on the other hand, we also can take this kind of tiny standalone cluster as a team shared uh, cluster, which provides a new multi-tenant management styles for, for us. <laughs> This uh, has been approved like that. Uh, this is very helpful to foster uh, collaboration and uh, maximize the resources utilization. So after you know, finalizing the motivations and uh, the design choices, how to you know, design and uh, implementation is relatively straightforward. <coughs> Here is our design principle like how to support running standalone cluster on top of Kubernetes. Firstly, we try to provide a unified Spark operator. As I mentioned the previous slide, uh, we have been leveraging this kind of open source uh, software, which is called Spark Kubernetes operator. Right, right now, it's uh, merged to the Kubeflow, uh, this you know, GitHub repo. <coughs> and uh, we try to continually using this kind of uh, you know, code base and try the one important thing is we try to ensure the totally compatibility to our platform to continually support our users to using regular Spark app, this kind of CRDs. Secondly, we try to provide an extendable framework based on these operators. And uh, for the CRD life cycle measurement, of course, we also try to make it fully automated. And uh, Status up update is very important, and we try to leverage CRD's status update so our batch gateway can fetch that details back to our users so they can know what's their cluster status or job status. So we try to provide these capabilities as well. As I mentioned before, we try to make the ma uh, Spark master and the Spark worker to keep them always running on top of uh, Kubernetes. So the cost efficiency is going to be a concern. So we try to provide uh, some cost efficiency, you know, solutions. <coughs> so here is some detailed uh, implementation we have did. Um, first of all, uh, like I mentioned, uh, Spark Master provides REST API. So in the new versions of uh, Spark Operator, it, right now it can provide both submission style you can either via Spark submit shell script or REST, REST API to submit your job. <laughs> Secondly, we introduced two new CRDs and their corresponding controllers to manage, which is uh, one is a Spark standalone cluster. So we allow users for, to firstly create a standalone cluster. And secondly, we in introduced a new CRD which is called a Spark application on standalone. So we, so we allow users to, submission, to submit their Spark application to the corresponding standalone clusters. <laughs> we're also able to allow users to edit the initial containers and the sidecars to their standalone clusters. 
This is very helpful, especially when user try to, you know, um, download some very large scale, you know, artifacts or even machine learning models. And usually user try to leverage their initial container to do this. <coughs> sidecar, uh, for example, we try to leverage the sidecar to allow user to make some, you know, authentication uh, stuff. <coughs> as, uh, as I mentioned the previous slides, uh, like uh, cost efficiency. And so for each CRD, we will autom automatically add it a pod levels of the scalar, uh, which is called, you know, HPA <laughs> to each CRD. So we, as a start point right now, we only take, you know, uh, CPU utiliza utilization, this metric to trigger the uh, scaling. <coughs> uh, the last thing is we try to provide both the cluster levels you know, observer and the job levels observer. For the cluster levels observer, because as I mentioned, the master provide API and it uh, provides some methods to check the master's status. For the job status observer, and uh, we can try to, you know, append the driver ID and the application ID to the request and to check the uh, corresponding Spark application uh, status. <clears throat> so here is uh, the example to the two new CRDs. On the left hand is the Spark standalone cluster CRDs. You can see we user only need to specify the master and the workers resources and then a new st uh, standalone cluster will be created. <laughs> On the uh, right hand, there is a, this is an example for the Spark application on standalone. We can see, if you're familiar the previous, I mean, the original Spark operator CRD definitions, you can see this is pretty similar to that CRD definitions. And uh, we, st we keep uh, most of their, you know, fields like main application files and the environment uh, variables and the Spark conf. The only new field we added is the Spark cluster service name, so we can identify which standalone cluster are going to be run this uh, applications. Uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much about how we implement the Spark operator. The next thing is how we integrate to our existing uh, Spark platform. <laughs> we try to reuse every component uh, I mentioned before. Firstly, we're able to reuse the batch processing gateway just, uh, with just uh, added some new CRD support, supported. As I mentioned, it tries to translate user's request to the new CRD's object. Secondly, we're able to reuse the Spark history server because we made some optim internal optimization to you know, indexing all the logs we stored on the uh, you know, uh, storage object uh, object storage system. <clears throat> uh, thirdly, we able to reuse Unicode to manage the multi-tenant resource quota and the limitations per queue. And we continue can use the queue to manage this kind of stuff. Also, and uh, if, you really, if you remember, I just applied HPA, HPA to the pod levels of the scaling, but we still able to reuse Cluster autoscaler or carpenter to scale the machines to adjust uh, to support that kind of HPA uh, the its activities. So accordingly, this is a new architecture. You can see the most of components is no change. We just added the two new blocks to each uh, Spark Kubernetes clusters. And uh, we can leverage Unicode to manage uh, several uh, standalone clusters. <laughs> and uh, so that being said, uh, every tenant, tenant, I mean our you know, platform tenant, can either using the new standalone cluster or the previous uh, regular Spark application CRDs on the same queue. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about why this kind of new Spark operator can provide a pro pro production grade spot and why it's faster, safer, and serverless. 
is this is a data point we collect we collected. <laughs> Firstly, let's take the original you know design as a baseline, which is means like uh, we keep using Kubernetes uh, as the resource manager. And but let's take uh, the baseline like uh, resources use pattern as a temporal. What that means? That means all the virtual machine going to be start uh, at the code uh, status. Like uh, it will require autoscaler and carpenter to provision the machine, and then uh, leverage Unicode to allocate the port to these new machines. <laughs> we call we let's take this as baseline, and then the first thing is we did is we try to keep that machine running, and then to check the, what's the average startup time. By the way, when we doing some baseline benchmark and we find that the average startup time is around 30 to 90 seconds per each application. Here the application is, is required around 1,000 pods to, to be created. <laughs> so if we keep that virtual machine is running, the average startup time is going to be two times faster. That means the average, you know, startup time is around 30 to 40 seconds. If we leverage our new design, like uh, we, if we submit our application to a team shared Spark standalone mode, the average startup time will be 10 times faster than the baseline. And uh, basically our testing number is around four to five seconds per each Spark applications. <laughs> Another thing is why we think a standalone cluster is more safer. First thing, uh, as you know, this is going to be a long running standalone cluster. It's more stable. And it's also help our infra engineer to, you know, when we're doing some authentication and authorization, we always try to keep, uh, you know, talking to API server, especially when we repeated creating the new pod and delete. But if we keep a long running standalone cluster, it will hugely, you know, uh, decrease the, uh, reduce the, you know, API server's uh, stress. And also it's uh, help us very, you know, more easier to audit all their, you know, activities. Secondly, because we added, uh, added a new layers of, you know, uh, like, uh, standalone cluster to our customers. And we can provide a more granular of a security isolation. We can apply a dedicated service account and their policies or AM roles to it. Thirdly, uh, we, it provides a tenant autonomy. So that being said, we no need to expose all the you know, necessary policies. So users still can get some new information for the, this kind of standalone cluster. Because previously, user only, need, only can get a, a status from the pod level and their, public, uh, their application level status. Right now, they also can get some you know, master and worker levels status. Um, third thing is how it supports the serverless. Yeah, the first thing is like uh, we simplify the you know cluster creation process. User just need a single API call. User can create their dedicated, uh, even team shared uh, you know cluster on top of Kubernetes, and they no need to consider what kind of virtual machine, instant type families they going to select, and what kind of storage layer going to select. Our you know platform try to help them. <coughs> Also, they no need to continually like uh, update the Spark version, and uh, our infra or platform can handle the, handle it. They are going to. We try to you know maximize the resources isolations, so there are going to be no idle capacity with the help of HPA autoscaler, a uh, cluster autoscaler together. <laughs> also, user only can pay only their current usage. At the end. Uh, um, if you remember the, recall the previous slide, we try to also provide some observabilities functionalities. So at the bottom, we, you know, build some uh, cost pipelines to calculate uh, uh, every 
cluster level and the application levels cost the numbers for our users. <coughs> On the other hand, what's the new to our users? <laughs> By introducing this standalone cluster, and because I mentioned the Spark Master also provide a new UI, so we expose this new UI to our users. So they need to learn how to, you know, use, uh, leverage this new Spark Web UI. On this uh, Spark UI, you can check all the submitted uh, applications and the running status of your jobs. And you also can check the worker status, like um, uh, CPU and the memory usage, that kind of stuff. So they can fetch more details, uh, not only you know, driver and executors, but also master and workers. Uh, of course, we provide a new option to a team share the long running cluster and uh, new options for the Jupyter uh, users. And uh, lastly, uh, it helps us um, able to run uh, RE on top of uh, Spark cluster. If you look at RE's uh, you know, official website, you can, you can see right now RE only can run it on standalone cluster. <coughs> Okay, lastly, this is our ongoing work. For, thank you. Uh, first of all, we try to provide a better multi-tenant management. Uh, if you remember, recall what I mentioned before, right now, the vanilla Spark master is, uh, you know, code base right now, only support the faithful scheduling. And we try to, you know, make some patch to the Spark master to able to, you know, uh, support uh, other scheduling strategy like fair or pri priority based uh, you know scheduling um, secondly Spark master is a kind of a stateful service and uh, we try to um, make uh, you know um, avoid any kind of restart failings and uh, we are considering leverage PVC and the state for set to support this master pod. And lastly, but a very, a lot of huge work to the third party is like how to improve the debugability to our platform. This is an ongoing issue from the, our you know, previous platform as well. And we try to continually optimizing the logging metrics and the web UI for our users. Um, yeah, I think that's all my today's sharing. And now it's time for the question. <clears throat> Hello. Is the operator you showed open source? And we can all find it somewhere, <laughs> use it? Yeah, good question. At, when we started this project, uh, this is the first question we you know, think. As you know, right now, the open source of the Spark uh, Kubernetes operator is already merged to the under Kubeflow. Right now, we have a you know, um, better position to make PR to that public repo. And right now, we try to speed up this kind of process internally, and we go into, you know, merge our PR to the open source software soon. Thank you. Hello, thank you for pre the presentation. Um, so my question is, as I know, Spark standalone mode does not support Python, uh, PySpark code. Um, so do I understand correctly that in your like solution, there won't be support for Python code? Uh, I don't in, think that's a correct statement. Uh, based on our internal testing, firstly, you need uh, using Spark cluster mode. Yes, so cluster mode does not support Python right now. No, actually, based on our internal testing, it definitely supports. And, but you just need uh, using the right way of Spark Master API. To submit, the, uh, to submit the job. That being said, that main class is going to be not your applications, uh, no, uh, Spark applications main class, but uh, you have to using, uh, I didn't show that, but you have to using a Java submit, that kind of 
class as a main application file, and then added your Python application file to the dependency path, then you're able to run. Oh, so you don't use native Python support for Spark, uh, but you submit Java code and run Python from there, right? Yeah, but uh, this is a capability already supported to the current Spark master source code. Okay, thank you. We can, yeah, we can check detail offline. Hi. Hi. Uh, have you considered using Spark Connect to furtherly shorten the <laughs> start data pine? Thanks. So the question is why not uh, we leverage Spark Connect instead of using the very old uh, Spark standalone mode, right? And uh, yeah, we made a lot of research to the Spark Connect. At that time, at least, I mean, you know, half years ago, Spark Connect is not that mature. It cannot support the data frame, and uh, a lot of Python UDF still cannot uh, support. That's why we, you know, didn't uh, leverage it. But I think, uh, you know, when the Spark Connect is, you know, mature, getting mature, we may be able to support it. But uh, the main advantage maybe is provide more debug abilities for our users and maybe better for the Jupyter notebook users, but not uh, for the large scale workload. But uh, leverage this uh, st standalone cluster, you also can run in Ray. I don't think uh, Spark Connect can, you know, Connect can support this. Thank you. <coughs> Last question. Uh, what are the challenges of running Ray on Spark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, I think the first question is, the uh, first thing is, the uh, first challenge we're facing is uh, dependence management. Even though we can leverage, you know, container or Docker file to manage this, but you know, if we're running some GPU-based machine learning workloads, it's very hard to find the combination versions of, you know, CUDA driver, you know, uh, NVIDIA driver, CUDA, you know, 2K, this kind of stuff with the, you know, other, you know, machine learning framework. That's, uh, one of the you know, first you know, challenges we are facing right now. And secondly, how efficiently you know, improve the GPU utilization with the various tools and accelerators and doing whatever inference or training. That is the ongoing challenges we are facing. And uh, yeah, and we can share more detail offline if you need it. <laughs> okay. uh, uh Good question. How, how do you scale um, standalone clusters in response uh, to varying uh, work, workload queue, like uh, nightly batches or mon uh, Monday morning spikes on the submissions of the jobs? So basically your question is how to handle peak usage for the submissions, right? <laughs> yeah, basically uh, right now as a start point, we allow users to specify the minimum and the maximum pod numbers to your CRDs, and then leverage HPA to adjust the pod numbers inside this range. That's our current status. But how to support, you know, abstract, you know, or peak usage for the very large scale or backfill use cases, we haven't explored that. But basically I would say in that case, we may, you know, encourage user to over, over provision their you know, Spark pod, uh, Spark standalone clusters. So we can leverage HPA to do that, but not. Uh, uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your time. <laughs>